right now we have Professor Jennifer Howard Grenville who will talk about ESG, what it means, and what we at CJBS are doing about that. So welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Conrad. It's great to be here. And welcome to everyone who's joining us from around the world. Jennifer, first of all, we read so much about ESG, but how do companies actually measure their ESG impact? Well, this is a really hot topic for a number of companies right now. Um, as we know, ESG has been getting more and more important in terms of a measure of performance for companies. Stakeholders all over the world um, in all sorts of different segments from consumers to employees, prospective employees, regulators, members of the supply chain, investors, um, all of these stakeholders are demanding higher and higher ESG performance and action than ever before. And of course, the challenge comes, how do you know how you're doing? How do you keep score? Um, so there's been a huge amount of change in recent years as companies are looking for harmonized, standardized, uh, transparent and assurable ways of measuring their ESG performance. But to date, so far, most companies have undertaken voluntary approaches. Um, there are lots of frameworks out there. The Global Reporting Initiative was one of the earliest ways that people sought to use agreed upon ways to define even what their E, S, and G impacts are. Of course, by E, we mean environmental, S, social, and G, governance. And so there's been a lot of efforts to define what actually falls within those different categories, um, what we need to baseline and measure within them. But there's also been a lot of divergence because most of the frameworks so far have been voluntary. Um, however, you know, they're quite robust. So for example, if a company wants to take a science-based targets approach, they need to work with the science-based targets organization and ensure that they're setting goals and commitments that are consistent with the science-based approach to, for example, climate change. Um, and from those goals and commitments might flow specific things that they would then need to measure. But we haven't yet reached the point where we have um, harmonized, standardized approaches to how we measure what we report and what those measurements really mean yet. Jennifer, how does this work? Because you say E, S, and G, they're like three different buckets. Obviously, they're interrelated. Um, do companies have to do well on all three or are there minimum standards in all three buckets that they have to attain? Well, I think it's up to the stakeholders. Um, as I said, we're ratcheting up our expectations. Um, investors were really, really huge, uh, kind of pre-pandemic, but really during the pandemic, the investment community, be community became very, very active in what it was asking firms to do around E, S, and G. Um, investors, individual investors like you and me, became much more attentive to whether we were investing in mutual funds, for example, that um, used ESG criteria. So it's, it's important that we do measure these things. As you pointed out, actually just measuring them as separate entities isn't even enough because, for example, we could have a positive impact on climate, but it might be detrimental to our social impact or vice versa. And even within a category, we could have a very positive impact on biodiversity and nature or reduction of plastics pollution, but at the same time increase the energy consumption or the fossil fuel consumption of our organization. So really what we need to think about actually is rather than obsessing over the categories and the measurement and individually optimizing in any given area, we need to be really mindful of what creates a sustainable organization and what sustainability really means, which is these things working in harmony so our organizations, our industry, our economies don't overtax people and planet as they have been doing to date. And actually achieving sustainability is even harder than measuring ESG. So measuring ESG is a really important step along the way to start to orient to what even are the factors that matter where environmental impact, social impact, and our govern governance practices really can shift and make a difference. And then we have to ask the question of what are the interdependencies and subtleties so that we make sure that we're not optimizing or improving one area and decreasing performance in another. 
you mentioned about this lack of harmonization. At the same time, you've got mutual funds, investors who are uh, paying a lot of attention into what these companies are doing for ESG. So how do rating agencies like, let's say, MSCI, how do they measure ESG across all the kinds of funds that are listed? So that's a great question. And historically, um, there are a handful of rating agencies that have undertaken very significant and detailed efforts to measure, to for both define um, you know, what the components are of, an, of, of E, S, and G that matter to them and to their investment community or whoever their stakeholders are. Um, and then they've then made efforts to obtain data on firms and rate firms' performance against those various ESG criteria. So it's done uh, robustly, but it's also been done in a way that has been undertaken by these individual rating agencies. And there's been some recent work, uh, it's about five years old now, but it still applies, which has found actually through research conducted by people at MIT, that the correlation between the five or maybe six major rating agencies on ESG is very low. So for example, I might take Apple and one rating agency might rate them well, one rating agency might rate them poorly. The correlation actually between these leading rating agencies was something like 0.67 or two thirds. Um, if you think about credit ratings, so financial credit ratings, the correlation that different agencies have for a given company's performance in terms of financial credit rating is 0.99. So we have almost perfect agreement on credit ratings. We have very imperfect agreement on ESG ratings. And that's persisting. And there's a couple of reasons for that, which is that actually, if you are MSCI, you get to define with your stakeholders in mind um, what counts as good. And so you might say, you know, for us, the following social factors count as good human slaver, slavery, for example, in the supply chain or gender equity. But another rating agency might count different factors as good. They also might exclude or include, include certain factors. So for example, do we exclude as a rating agency um, firms that have any association with the arms industry or the tobacco industry? So rating agencies might differ on those criteria. And importantly, they also differ on the weightings that they ascribe. So while we both might include human slavery in the supply chain and gender equity as social factors, we might have a heavier or lighter weighting on those two. And so that all adds up to this confusion we see in the marketplace historically around lack of agreement around what the ESG ratings are. So you could have a given firm look good, look bad, or look somewhere in between. Um, and you know they say reasonable people can, can disagree. So, that was what was going on for a long time. The exciting and interesting thing and the thing that many, many firms are focused on right now is we've now moved past that point for obvious reasons. We can't make sound investment decisions either as individuals or as organizations or as the financial sector if we don't know what good looks like and we can't agree on it. So what's happening now is very, very rapidly, you know, watch this space. Um, approaches for um, harmonizing what firms will need to disclose um, around climate, around social, and around governance factors. And so once those arrive, and those are coming very quickly, I can say more about that in a moment, um, we will actually have countries then regulating that firms within their jurisdictions need to comply with certain approaches for disclosure and reporting. And that will move us out of this regime where we have much lower correlation, but you know, in terms of um, ESG ratings, and eventually, not tomorrow, but eventually towards a much greater sense of what good looks like. So Jennifer, does this mean that for individual investors like you and I, and we want to invest in companies that are doing well in ESG, um, we actually have to really read through all that ratings methodology to understand what they're measuring before we make that decision? Well, we might have to, or we might have to hope that someone else has done it for us. And I think this is one of the challenges. It's that these issues themselves are complex. So when it comes to climate, actually, we can measure a company's climate 
impact quite readily and there have been many ways that climate impact has been reported the carbon disclosure project for example for a long time has been working on making publicly available data on um, firms climate performance however we are still in a regime where even for that type of measurement um, scope three emissions so emissions that occur in the value chain beyond the direct control of the organization we don't have good ways to measure those. We don't have good ways to, um, to decide what counts as in and out and how we're not double counting. And they're certainly not assurable. So most firms, if you look these days, if they're saying they have a net zero commitment or certain commitments, you need to look at the fine print and say, are they counting scope one and scope two, which are um, emissions that are more directly within their control? Um, are they counting scope three? you know, what are their goals, what are their ambitions, what proportion of their emissions are in scope one and two versus scope three. Because the difficult challenge is for many, many firms, scope three is by and large the, the, the biggest area of their climate impact. That's just climate where we can actually agree on, you know, a CO2 equivalent as a unit of measure, it's a scientific unit and we can agree on what good and bad looks like. And it doesn't matter whether I'm emitting a ton of CO2 in India and you're emitting an equivalent portion of methane in Namibia. Um, we can actually agree on an equivalency between them. And that's been done scientifically. What gets even messier in terms of consumers, especially, and anyone consuming these data is, you know, what does it mean to have eliminated child labor in your supply chain? Um, how do we know? Uh, what does it mean to have gender equity in terms of your boards? Um, is that just by counting the number of men and women on the board? Or can you actually learn more about the decision making process and whether different voices are included and whether that's actually having an impact on how the organization is run? So you see very quickly that even if we had pretty good data that companies were reporting, um, there's still a lot of um, need to really more deeply understand the processes, um, understand that some of our judgments will tend to be subjective. So even with this coming approach of harmonizing the criteria for disclosure, first off, we're working on climate first. That is going to be one of the first standards established by both the major sort of, um, uh, there, there's sort of two slightly competing, um, but they're complementary approaches. One is called the ISSB, International Sustainability Standards Board. Um, they will actually publish in June of 2023. So this month they will publish their first standard around what comprises ESG reporting. So how to do it, what firms must do. Um, and then their second standard will be around climate reporting. And they will develop uh, reporting standards for um, for social, for governance, for other aspects of environmental impact over the coming years. Um, so those will first be published in June. Companies will need to report on, I believe it's 2024 data by 2025. So that might seem like a way off, but it, essentially it's tomorrow. And the ISSB standards are being set by the IFRS, which also sets um, gap standards and uh, accounting standards. So the actual impact of those will be quite important. They, the standard setting body simply sets the standards. It's then up to governments like the UK or Japan. They have indicated that they will be likely to adopt those standards. So companies headquartered are doing significant amounts of business within their jurisdictions will eventually be required to report. So most of the firms I'm talking to right now are very, very focused on what these standards are saying, what it will ask of them and how they'll comply. Um, and then there's another standard to be being developed um, in Europe by the European Union. And it's got a slightly different and more comprehensive approach. But again, they're starting with general reporting standards, climate focused standards, but they're moving a little bit more aggressively and deeply, especially on the social standards. Um, and they're already asking firms to go beyond, or they will be asking firms to go beyond reporting information that is material just in relation to investment decisions but information that is material in terms of social good. So in other words, the European approach says, we care about whether there's child labor or slavery in your supply chain, not because it might pose a risk to investors who are investing in your company or not only, 
but because we fundamentally believe in the promotion of human rights and human dignity. So um, the European standards are being seen as more encompassing. And again, firms who are either headquartered or doing significant business in the EU, EU will be required to comply with those. So when you think about international firms, they have two different approaches of these rapidly developing standards, and they're orienting towards both in many cases, because they may be required to report on both. So that's a long and complicated answer to how do we as consumers actually um, get a grip on this. But the good news is that the standard setting bodies and the regulators are moving into this space. So I think what you and I will see in terms of what companies are reporting and how credible that is, um, it'll soon be a little bit more like not soon, but in coming years, it'll be a little bit more like food labeling, where when we pick up a label in this country and we see it has X grams of fat and Y grams of sugar, we don't have to go do our own research on that. Mm. We can take that as that is something that has been established and is set up as, as a harmonized approach, and we can take those data as real. But between now and that point, we kind of are still in a world where we should be asking closer questions. Mm. Is it also the case then that different industries will have different sort of benchmarks, the same way that um, in finance, we learn about valuation and then we compare it to a, a peer group. Will that also be the case, you think, with ESG? Yeah, I think already. I mean, again, because we've been in this sort of this voluntary realm and it's robust, but still voluntary, there have been many approaches where organizations are being compared to peers um, because we know that even if we don't have standard perfect measures, you know, if I can show you that your approach to um, the gender pay gap or, you know, your data, your performance on the gender pay gap is overperforming or underperforming your peers, and especially if I can disclose that publicly, that's going to spur some action. So it's really important. Um, and that issue might cut across industries in, in different ways. But more importantly, when we start to look at climate impact, when we start to look at the use of materials or, or you know, use of scarce materials, when we start to look at water impact, it really matters um, not just where in the world that you're having those impacts, but also are you a mining company versus fast moving consumer goods? Obviously your impact on those environmental areas is going to be quite different as well as the social areas. So I think it's really important when we judge uh, companies' performance that we're comparing them to a reasonable peer group. Um, and we're also disclosing and sharing what the best practice looks like. Because I think one of the things, I mean, I've been studying this stuff since way before it was cool, like more than 20 years. Um, and one of the things that's always interesting is when a company really leaps ahead and shows that something is possible, viable, and is making them, you know, not just profitable, but helping them grow their business and grow their impact, like a circular economy approach, for example, it inspires others to compete. It inspires others to say, hey, that's possible. And so I think we really need to free ourselves a certain amount from from the sort of stick approach, which is do no wrong, you know, and we'll judge you harshly if we measure that you're doing badness. Also showing what goodness looks like, what the possibilities are um, to innovate and to really leap ahead and deliver different approaches and business models that, that make us think differently about the impact um, that we're having, uh, you know, that companies are having and what we can imagine differently. I imagine that many companies will have to put in place new systems to measure their ESG impact. They all have their established systems to measure cash flow, assets and liabilities, mm -hmm. etc. So how are companies going about that process of putting in place these processes? And do you feel that at some point it becomes overly on onerous to keep getting this data instead of mm -hmm. actually focusing on the business? Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, in this country, a few years ago, we had GDPR uh, data protection um, requirements come in, and that, that required a huge amount of effort um, on organizations to make sure they had the processes, make sure they had the data collection in place, and the and the sort of you know back end processes that could manage all of that. It was a big deal. I don't want to belittle anyone who worked through that, but we got through that. 
Um, the Human Slavery Act is also an act that came in um, in the UK a number of years ago. Again, that asked companies to look deeply into their supply chains and investigate whether there might be a possibility of human slavery in their supply chain. So it's onerous, it requires action, but first off, you know, it, A, it's the right thing to do, that's the way the world is going. B, well-managed companies hopefully will have had some tab on this to begin with. And so it really is creating a level playing field where everyone's required to do it, everyone understands that they're doing it. And so I think with the transitions that we're facing right now, when ESG disclosure and reporting is becoming harmonized and standardized, that's an important step. It will take a lot of effort. The firms I'm talking to definitely feel the pain um, in, in terms of, you know, they're getting their systems and processes in place. Um, they are hiring like you wouldn't believe in terms of people who have skills and expertise for this. But I think you're absolutely right. We do not want to take our eye off the ball, that actually what we're trying to do is create businesses that are more sustainable, that actually lower impact on our planet, um, improve their social impact, um, address rampant social inequalities, um, you know, really are robust against the energy transition, the damage that we've done to climate and nature. And that involves the big picture. That involves thinking much more broadly. That involves thinking, how do we have influence beyond our borders? Because again, most of companies' impact is not stuff that they directly <coughs> control. So getting distracted by the measurement and thinking measurement is the only thing is, I think, the biggest danger in the coming years. Um, so keeping enough people focused on the big picture, focused on the opportunity and focused on the strategy. So it's not just a trade-off though, because one of the most important and I think exciting things, um, and I'm not an accountant, I'm an organizational change person, but I do enjoy leaning into what the accountants are doing to help save the world. And I think this is huge. I mean, it's an absolutely game-changing um, set of criteria and standards that, that, that 10 years from now we'll look back on and go, wow, you know, that enables a whole different way of understanding where companies are at. And that's enabling internal knowledge um, and integration. So part of what you have to do for ISSB is actually lay out what your strategy is, what your risks are, not just what your risks around climate are, what your opportunities are, and what your transition plan is. And now that all starts to sound like good strategy right, and good management, which is actually, we'll take these, the standard um, sort of, you know, we'll take this approach of complying with standards and we'll actually make it help us run our business differently with these uh, new forms of impact in mind. So how can we have a more positive impact um, on environment? How can we have a more positive impact on social? So I think there is a complementarity if, if organizations are able to lean into the fact that we're not just doing this to check the boxes and report, we're doing this because it will make us think hard and deeply and strategically and in a forward-looking way about our impact and how we can improve it. And that ought to unleash change and innovation as well. I'm sure our accounting colleagues would love what you said about them being the superheroes that will save the planet. Um, <laughs> they want. <laughs> One thing that you know accountants uh, do is obviously check accounts, uh, check for misrepresentation. So on the ESG side, we've seen the European Banking Authority, for example, highlighting the big risk of e banks misrepresenting the sustainability efforts. Um, Jennifer, how can we as investors or as rating agencies tell when a company is so-called greenwashing? Mm. Yeah, again, I think, you know, it's difficult to tell because um, in the original days of ESG reporting, and I even remember the day when an ESG report uh, was actually, uh, you know, hard copy, uh, where you could get a brochure from a company and you would flip through it. It was a bit like a magazine and they had, you know, lovely animals and, and communities where they were working hard and people showing themselves planting, planting trees and you know stories sell and that's important but those were the days when there really was no harmonization in what we were asking companies to report on how they were representing it so we have come a long way and yes we don't print most of these sustainability reports on paper anymore 
Um, but still, there is a tendency sometimes for some companies towards selective disclosure, which is we're going to tell you the good news story and, or the pilot project or the example of this community engagement, um, and we don't really have the whole picture. So that's why, and it's not just accountants who are going to save the world, leadership <laughs> will save the world, strategy will save the world, innovation will save the world, and yes, even marketing and finance and operations. Um, so we, we all need to work together on this, but I think... Um, when it comes to detecting greenwashing, uh, this this is, you know, I'm speaking as if all of these things are fantastic and there's a coming transformation in how ESG will be reported and acted on. But, you know, as you point out, there's a lot of division, there's a lot of pushback, there's a lot of things you can you can read the news each day and realize, you know, depending on your jurisdiction, um, there's pushback against ESG reporting and harmonization. Um, I think some of these things are relatively temporary. That doesn't mean that they're not difficult to work through. But every time there's a massive change in our expectations of what we want from each other and what we want from corporations, there's going to be this sort of tension that plays out. Um, but that said, I think greenwashing in particular is, like all other things, becoming more firmed up. So we're no longer in a regime where we can say, hey, you know, we love the, the nice picture and the pretty story. Fantastic. You're doing great. We are as consumers individually, but also as regulators, much, much more skeptical and aware. Um, I've heard that the CMA organization in the UK has actually just put out standards defining what greenwashing is. So we now have ways to even account for what the different ways are so you know it might be selective disclosure only saying the good stuff it might be um admitting that there are some positive things but not balancing those out against negative impacts so as you mentioned in, in the area of banks it's um people being alarmed over banks saying that they're funding the clean energy transition yet they're still invested in fossil fuels and this comes back to some really fundamental questions which is do we disengage or do we engage? Do we drive change by um, pulling out of the bad, quote bad, um, and only engaging with the good? Or do we approach from the inside and try to drive change from the inside? Um, I firmly believe that we need change everywhere all the time. Some organizations, some companies are in very, very hard to abate sectors. Um, and we need all of the engagement, all of the enthusiasm, all of the, the sort of innovation um, and leadership possible within those organizations and, and within those who are engaged and invested in them, um, which doesn't mean that we don't need to get away from fossil fuels. We do, absolutely, in the long run. Uh, but we need to think carefully about how we do so. So I think this question of greenwashing is, is really of concern right now because firms understandably are very, very aware of the risks of greenwashing, especially now that it's being uh, you know, regulated more firmly now that there are many, many things, not just in the court of the public opinion, but in courts themselves, advocacy groups um, bringing, uh, bringing firms to task over alleged greenwashing. Um, but I think, again, it's the long-term perspective. Where's our world going? What role does my business have to play in this? Where do I want to be in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? How am I going to sustain myself as a business serving the needs of societies and the needs of the planet, um, yet creating a viable business. And if you take that long-term view, you realize that you need to act authentically. You need to probably do more than you're saying rather than say more than you're doing. Um, and you know, don't let the fear of greenwashing hold back progress. Jennifer, you mentioned about the skills that company executives will need as they think about ESG. So what uh, is CJBS doing to teach executives about sustainability? We're doing a lot. Um, and as I mentioned, my area of research um, has been a couple of things since uh, for about 25 years. Um, one thing is organizational change, and in particular looking at organizational culture and how that feeds into the capacity to make innovative strategic change, which it can and it does. Culture is not just a break on change. And the other is sustainability or ESG, uh, even before we had those labels for it. Um, so I'm super excited because in the last handful of years, I've taught in the area of sustainable business 
throughout my career, but in the last handful of years, it's almost like we can't do enough. We are seeing a huge uptick in interest across our programs, um, and I teach electives on the MBA and the EMBA, but many of my colleagues who are specialists in, in energy, in uh, you know, social innovation, um, experts in sustainable finance, experts in operations management, um, experts in circularity and, and the circular economy. We have a whole host of, of courses that we're teaching um, in our core programs in these areas. Um, and that's fantastic to see the growing and sustained interest in those. Um, the other area that we're seeing a huge explosion of interest is in executive education. And we have both custom clients and also um, open programs now dedicated to ESG um, and much more demand uh, than we have ever seen in the past. And we're delighted to be able to sort of share our expertise. You know, we're Cambridge, so we have a lot of deep insights into our particular areas. But what we're seeing is I think people want to get beyond the, you know, how do I comply with the latest regulation and just tell me what, you know, these acronyms mean and, and, and I'll go. They want to more deeply understand, you know, why are we in this situation? So we introduce them to a little bit of systems thinking. You know, no firm out there, at least none that I've met, really had a business plan to trash the planet. Um, nor did they have a business plan to say, you know, we're going to create growing levels of social inequality and social unrest. And, you know, we're not going to educate girls or, you know, we're going to have children in slave labor. No business intended to do that. It's sort of an unintended consequence of how we've actually worked, which is we've decoupled economic growth and business growth from the impact it has on planet and people, in part because we haven't had price tags attached with, for example, a clean and robust atmosphere or clean waterways. Um, and regulation hasn't been enough. So, you know, I'm not blaming anything or anyone in particular, but when you start to step back and see sort of how we got here, what are the systemic pieces in play, you start to realize that actually any given organization has a huge obligation and responsibility to respond but it's very, very difficult to do so alone in the current system. As I mentioned several times, much of what the impact is that organizations have is felt through their supply chains, sometimes through their consumers and use of the product. Um, it's very, very hard to trans have transparency even into some of these areas, although firms are getting better, and it's even harder to exercise leadership. So we try to help um, people understand how can my organization not just use all the normal things of accounting practices, st strategic planning and innovation to do a better job. How can we also think differently about what our role is in terms of leading in a system? What are the areas that we can start to have influence in? How might we have to think differently about partnering um, across organizations to do things differently? Because that's the magnitude of the challenge. And I think what's interesting is people are showing up and getting it and saying, okay, the practices that we've had in the past are fine, but we need to think differently about the big picture. We need to think about where the world is going and what our role for business is in it, rather than just say, here's our product, here's our service, take it and move on. So there's much more openness to the system as a whole, to um, social and environmental impacts, um, and as well as to kind of paying attention to, to trends, um, to what diverse stakeholders are asking for. I think there's also recognition that, that this stuff is not easy at all. Um, even if we had all the data, even if we knew what the right direction of travel was, even if we all agreed on what good looks like, there's a huge amount of effort to redo that. So there's uncertainty and ambiguity, and I think that's one of the areas that we're teaching and that people are realizing, what are the skill sets for leadership in this area? What kind of expertise do we need to know? And yes, we can teach you what the latest and greatest is in this kind of standard or this approach to circularity or what have you, but the people who are leading and um, operating in businesses in the decades to come really will have to learn quickly They'll have to be open to ideas. They'll have to be open to shifts because let's be honest, we are going to have to adapt to a very different planet, um, which means you know, thinking through how do we create flexible, adaptable business plans? How do we support our people who might be subject to different things that seem shocking right now, but are going to become more com commonplace in terms of extreme weather and disruptions of that nature? 
disrupting supply chains. So I think we do need to take seriously that people need to learn different ways of being a business leader and that some of that starts with being a bit more decentralized, learning, learning from different places, partnering differently and being more comfortable with ambiguity, but not using that as a reason not to act.